Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here this morning, a day that we get to come together and give thanks and praise to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and lift up his name. And as we do today, we're going to dive into a story uh, that kind of can just continuing on from where we've been for the past few weeks. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 22, uh, looking at the third and final parable that Jesus is giving there on the Tuesday of Holy Week. Uh, today we have the, the parable of the, the wedding feast. Um, so we get to see how God interacts with his people, how, how the invitations that have been sent out uh, to, to others, how they responded, and we get to take a look and ask ourselves that question, how have we responded to God's same invitation to us? So blessings on your worship service today as we look into those truths. Uh, announcements, let's see here. Uh, confirmation starts today, so if you have a kid in confirmation, there is a meeting right after the second service. Um, we'll, we'll gather together briefly. Um, and uh, start off our, our confirmation program for this year. Uh, let's see here, coming up, mark your calendars, make sure you got it, Sunday, October 29th, uh, our Reformation Sunday worship service. There's gonna be a single service, so one service at 1030, followed directly by our Oktoberfest celebration. So, so come to 1030 worship, we'll worship together as a congregation, and then stay for the Oktoberfest and have a lot of fun there. Um, so make sure you get that, couple weeks. Uh, and governing board nominations. If you have someone who you'd like to nominate for next year's governing board, please do so. I think you have one more week to get those nominations in the deadlines next week. Uh, there is a box in the back and some forms back there. You can nominate yourself, you can nominate somebody else, anybody in the con member of the congregation over the age of 18. Um, so please get in those nominations. You got one more week to do that. And let's see here, the men's lunch group is meeting this together this Thursday. They are going to meet Mary Yoder's out in Middlefield, and they'll be meeting at noon there. But if you're interested in carpooling, uh, talk to Gary or Lee after worship. I think they're going to meet here and then carpool out there to, to Middlefield. So if you're interested in doing that, talk, talk to them after, after worship today. And I think that's it for all of our announcements. Uh, so let's talk remediation. Take a look at where we're at today. Uh, so lots of things have kind of continued from last week. Uh, last week I showed you that they got in and started painting some of the offices and you know we're, we're into that. They have finished that, fi finished all those, those little rooms and offices up this week. Uh, so that's you know the music office, my office, uh, this back room. Uh, those are all nicely, freshly new painted. Uh, bathroom got finished up, all the little details they got through and have done that. Um, and let's see, the... Uh, the Yoda room, uh, also I showed you last week they were really working to get all that wallpaper off, uh, the old wallpaper. Uh, funny story, he told me in the end they ended up sanding it off. That's how, that's how good it was on there. They had to sand the wallpaper down and to get it off. Uh, but they, they worked through that this week and then got a, got a little bit of paint up on the walls there too. Uh, and then, I don't know if you even, if you can really tell, but they painted this room too. Uh, you know, not a whole lot of change to this room. Uh, but this, and, and people say, you know, this room wasn't so bad. And it wasn't because it was painted right before the fire. Like a month <laughs> before the fire, this had all been painted. Uh, so they, they came in uh, over this past few days and uh, knocked this room out. So it's kind of nice, nice and crisp and... I don't know, I can't even really smell the paint anymore, can you? That's, that's pretty impressive. They were, they were in here painting yesterday morning. Uh, and uh, let's see, last week I told you that uh, they had started laying uh, the padding for the new carpet in the sanctuary, and this week they started uh, to get some carpet down. So do you want to see the first glimpses of, of the real carpet? No jokes this time, no, no tease. This is our new carpet. It is a beautiful, kind of rich, patterned blue. Uh, it looks, the, the pictures don't do it justice. It looks really nice in there. So we're, we're looking forward to having that spread out over the rest of the, the week and the coming weeks and getting that all, getting that sanctuary worked up and, and getting that finished so we can get the pews back in and, and then get back in there to worship. So it's, Things are coming along. Uh, every week, just a little one step closer. It won't be long before we get to uh, return back to the sanctuary. Hopefully, hopefully soon. So that's it for remediation this week. And with that, let us begin our worship service, which starts with our opening hymn, hymn number 694, Thee Will I Love, My Strength, My Tower. Please stand. <laughs>
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. Deal with us not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. <clears throat> and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, <clears throat> Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is run from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 13. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to ever, everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. He said, then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. When the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Let us now confess together our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we sing together hymn number 510, A Multitude Comes from the East and the West. <clears throat>
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This is our third and final, perhaps, week in a row, joining Jesus on the Tuesday of Holy Week as he stands in the temple of Jerusalem just days before Passover, and he preaches to the crowds and the priests three parables about what really boils down to the future of the church and the people in it. Each of these parables that Jesus tells get, get a bit more directed and intense as he goes on. From the relatively tame parable of the two sons who either obey or not obey their father, to the parable of the wicked tenants who forsake the vineyard owner and kill his messengers, to today's parable of the wedding feast with all its royal pomp and circumstance, a little more casual murder of the messengers thrown in, and one rowdy wedding guest being thrown into the fires of hell. With each of these parables, Jesus is just kind of turning up the heat a bit and making his message a little bit clearer. And everybody loves a clear message, right? Certainly everyone listening to Jesus there that day wanted him to preach clearly and, you know, out in the open. From the crowds who genuinely gathered to hear his teachings, to the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered around trying to trap him into incriminating himself. They were all hanging on Jesus' every word. Reminds me of the old Italian guy who lived alone in the country. It was spring, and he wanted to dig up his tomato garden, as he had done every year, but it was difficult work for the aging man, as the ground was very hard. His only son, Vincent, who used to help him, is currently in prison. So the old man wrote a letter to his son and described his predicament. Dear Vincent, I'm feeling down because it looks like I won't be able to plant my tomato garden this year. I'm just getting too old to till up the ground like that. If only were you here, if you were here, my troubles would be over. I know that you would help. Love, Dad. A few days later, he received a letter back from his son. Dear Dad, whatever you do, don't dig up the garden. That's where I buried the bodies. <laughs> Love, Vinny. <laughs> right and early the next morning, the FBI agents and the local police arrived at the old man's house and dug up the entire garden. <laughs> However, when they didn't find any bodies, they apologized to the old man and left. That same day, the man received another letter from his son. Dear Dad, go ahead and plant the tomatoes now. That's the best I could do under these circumstances. <laughs> Love, Vinny. Similarly, Jesus' parables in the temple that day were his way of outsmarting the chief priests. They provided insights into God's kingdom for those willing to dig a little deeper. So let's let that be us today. As we open up this parable, let's appreciate the art of the hidden message and the wisdom of looking beneath the surface. So Jesus sets the scene for them, telling them the kingdom of heaven is like a king's son who is getting married. And because of the way Jewish weddings happened at that time, you can picture it as the, the wedding has been announced, but a date has not yet been set. So the king, he sends out invitations to all the honored guests announcing the engagement and telling them to be ready for, you know, like a, a spring wedding or something like that. All the people have been invited and notified well in advance, even if they don't have a set date for the celebration. But then when spring rolls around and the time for the wedding feast suddenly arrives, the king sends his servants out to go out far and wide, letting those know who were invited that the feast was about to start. Everyone should drop what they're doing and come to the royal wedding. But nobody answered the call. They just didn't want to come. Which is, you know, already surprising, I think, because remember, this is not some cash bar affair, right? This is, this is a royal wedding feast. <laughs> We're talking choice, food, and drink. It's a celebration that you wouldn't want to miss. And the king, he must have thought the same thing because he sends out the servants again a second time. He's probably completely confused about why people aren't coming. So he kindly gives them all a second chance. He sends word with the servants to stress the immediacy of the event. The time is now. The table is literally prepared. The choice foods have been perfectly cooked. The oxen and the fattened calves are all ready to be served. The king and his staff have done all the work, 
He just needs people to show up and eat and drink and celebrate and be merry with him and his son. This, I mean, this should not be a hard sell. But the invited guests pay no attention to the call, and they just kind of go about their business. Worse, some of them even get violent with the servants, beating and even killing the messengers. Which, you know, that makes no sense, too, in the context of the parable. Why would you kill the messenger who simply invites you to a party? It shows absolutely no respect for the king, and the king is angry. He sends his troops to dispense justice, to destroy those murderers and burn their cities. But now the king is left with a wedding and no guests. So what's a king to do? He tells his servants to go out and just find people, anyone. Grab them from the roads, people just passing by. Pull them in and bring them to the feast. Just fill the seats. And they did. Without regard or distinction, the servants brought in anyone. The good, the bad, the ugly, anybody. <clears throat> if you were breathing and in the right place at the right time, you became a royal guest. So where the story ended poorly for the original invitees, it works out pretty good for the replacements. Now this parable, this story, it's definitely an allegory, right? The king in the story stands for God. The people found in the highways and the byways are probably the, the Gentiles, and the invited guests are the children of Israel. This has been you know, kind of the underlying message of all three of the parables that Jesus has told here. If you don't accept God's grace, someone else will. It's a warning to keep up and to recognize the Messiah who's been sent to them, to not make excuses and not reject him. And all the invited attendees in the story had excuses not to come to the banquet. You know, I gotta, I gotta work on my farm. I gotta run my business. All kind of work-based rejections that served as the basis for their declarations that they just didn't want to attend. It wasn't really that they had good reason. They just had excuses. And we see this mirrored in so many of the people in Jesus' day. They didn't have good reason not to listen to Jesus. They just didn't want to. They ignored all the good reasons, all the good evidence. The scribes and the Pharisees, they weren't interested in the kingdom of God that Jesus was bringing into the world because they kind of preferred the kingdom that they had built for themselves. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't eternal. But it put them above others. And our sinful natures tend to pervert, pr prefer that over a life that's better, but where we're all equal. It's part of our sinful nature. So the Pharisees, they made excuses. They stand up and they ask, by what authority does Jesus do this? They asked how the son of a carpenter can be the son of God. They came up with excuse after excuse not to believe in the kingdom of God which was coming through Jesus Christ. And in this day and age, people have 101 excuses not to be in the kingdom of God too. We come up with a lot of different excuses not to be in, in church on Sunday, where the kingdom of God is manifested here on this earth. It's through the church, the body of Christ, that the kingdom comes. For Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be also. That's here. That's now. And this part of this parable, it's pretty straightforward, right? God wants you to come and be with him. But you can reject that invitation. I mean, it's only an invitation. right? He's not standing there. He's not dragging you against your will. If you choose not to go then you don't have to go. But you miss out on everything that God is offering. And this is kind of the easy part to understand. God wants you to go to heaven, so he sends the invitation in his son. But you can reject it if you want. It's a familiar foundation to the story, and it serves as a basis for how we understand salvation. God invites us to his kingdom. All of us, whether we be a part of that original group of invitees 
or the secondary group outside of those original few. Through his son, God offers salvation and eternal life to all mankind. That's a gift that we don't earn. It comes from the generosity of the king. But the invitation isn't really all that's needed, is it? Right? The invitation calls us. But like the wedding guest, we can always refuse the invitation. In describing salvation, Luther tended to explain it as the wonderful gift of salvation. It, it always comes from God. The good is always from him. But the bad, the rejection, it's always from us. If it's good, it's from God. If it's bad, that's on us. And that, that helps explain what happens with the one guy at the end of our parable. The king comes in, right, and he sees all the people, and he's happy, you know, the wedding's filled finally, except he notices this one guy. This man is not dressed in a wedding garment. And the king immediately, he just goes into a rage. He demands to know how that man got in, and he has him thrown out into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth which don't miss it, right? That's Old Testament language code for, for hell. This guy is thrown into hell because he's not dressed right. And to the modern reader, that might seem a little harsh, right? Particularly since these replacement guests were just pulled in off the street. Of course, they didn't come dressed for a royal wedding. But what, what we kind of miss, what we're missing culturally here is that they didn't, they didn't need to come dressed for a royal wedding. Historically, the, the wedding garment would have been provided by the king. So the way to understand this, really what we should be reading here, is that the king has all these really nice robes ready and available at the door where everyone else, you know, they, they accept the gift of the robe, they put it on. But this one guy, he shows up, is offered the appropriate clothing, and he says, no, I don't care enough to take your robe. I'm going to keep on my dirty traveling clothes at your nice, fancy wedding. Take that. This man intentionally spurns the generosity and the hospitality of the king and insults him by refusing to accept the gift. It's really no different than the original invitees who refused to accept the invitation. Again, God can offer the good, but we can always refuse it, regardless if we were part of that, that first group or part of the second. The wedding garment here in our parable is the same robe of Christ's righteousness that's foreshadowed in, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah and then later in the New Testament book of Revelation. In order to put on this banquet robe that we need, we must simply put on Christ. He is our robe. He is our invitation to the banquet. He's our hope and our promise of eternal life. Through Christ's death and resurrection, we have the invitation to the greatest celebration of our lives. God has prepared a spiritual feast for anyone who wants to join with him. And he wants you to partake of that joy. God wants all people to come to the great banquet of his heavenly kingdom. And he will go out of his way to send you multiple invitations and sometimes even just seek you out and drag you to the door. But he won't force you to accept his gifts. He will literally put them in your hand, but he won't force you to hold them. You may not have earned the salvation offered to you by our Lord's sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, but you don't need to earn it to enjoy it. The secret here is you simply need to not reject it. Whether or not you come to the feast, it depends on you. If you do not prioritize your relationship with Jesus, you will never enter. And there will always be some excuse you can come up with, something you can prioritize higher than God. But you shouldn't. That would be a bad choice. And if you make that choice, that's on you. So instead, do what's better. Simply accept the invitation and come to God's kingdom. Thanks be to God for his grace, mercy, and overwhelming generosity. 
That's thanks to him. Our salvation, even our faith itself, faith itself, it's a gift. When we realize this, when we understand that it comes from God, we realize the secret to getting into the banquet, the secret to getting into heaven. That secret is that all good things come from God, not from us. They're a gift from Him. In in the vast expanse of the universe, in the grand parable of life, what a miracle it is to be invited by the Creator of all to be a part of this eternal banquet. And it's not about the finery that we wear or the titles we hold. It's about our willingness to simply accept his embrace, to wear the robe of righteousness that he offers. This world can be distracting, filled with its fleeting pleasures and temporary joys, but none compare to the eternal joy of being in the presence of our Savior. Let us cling to that invitation, an invitation etched with the blood of Christ and sealed in his love. May we choose every day, every moment, to accept his invitation and to put on Christ. For it is through his grace that we find true purpose, true joy, and eternal life. Let us hold on to this gift, cherish it, and share it. For in doing so, we find our true invitation to our true home. Amen. Now know that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now stand as the offerings are brought forward to the Lord. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, as we bring forth our offerings, we are reminded of your grand invitation to partake in your kingdom. Help us to respond with eagerness and gratitude, recognizing the value of the call. May these gifts aid in preparing a way for others to join the banquet, ensuring that all are clothed in your grace and love. Guide us to always be ready and worthy to sit at your table. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly King, your Son, Jesus Christ, purchased the church with his precious blood. Preserve her in the pure teaching of your word, in the right use of the sacraments, and in the, and in the unity of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Heavenly King, you send out your invitation that all who believe in your Son should take their seats at his feast. By the proclamation of your church, gather all to repent and fill your eternal banquet hall. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly King, bless all families and the homes in which our people dwell. Grant grace to husbands and wives that they may fulfill their vocations to one another and to their children. Grant also that as a family, they may faithfully teach and learn the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly King, keep keep the coming of your Son always at the forefront of heart and mind that subject for his sake to the fleeting powers of this world, we may live in continual godliness and the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly King, for whom we wait, you promise to wipe away the tears from all faces. Bless those we lift up to you this day, including Jennifer, Janet, Ken, Darlene, Deborah, Michael, Sarah, Nicole, Stella, Christine, Bob, Tia, Sandy, Renee, Don, Jim, Joe, and Marilyn, that they at the last may be comforted, restored, and received into the banquet of heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, with heavy hearts, we lift our prayers for the victims and all those affected by the recent violent attacks orchestrated by Hamas. We pray for the souls of the thousands of lives lost, the healing of the thousands more wounded, and for the comfort of families who are grieving. 
We entreat you for wisdom and courage for the leaders in Israel, Palestine, and the international community, that they may work tirelessly towards securing a lasting peace and ensuring the safety of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly King, you have prepared a table before us in the midst of those who refuse your invitation. Keep your church unstained by the world, that we may partake of our Lord's Supper worthily, clothed in his baptismal grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly King, give us such joy in pursuing what is true, just, pure, and worthy of praise, that spurning the temptations of this world, we would suffer no anxiety. Let our trust be placed fully in Christ, and let our hope rest in the life of the world to come. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give him thanks and praise. praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to do temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I now invite you to hold your communion chalices. <laughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Take and eat the true body of Christ, given for you. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Take and drink the true blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will strengthen and preserve you, steadfast in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in his peace and go in his joy. Amen.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. We sing together hymn number 514, The Bridegroom Soon Will Call Us. Mm -hmm. 